All right, so Matthew chapter 18. If you remember, the first time that the word, men, uh, the word church is mentioned in the New Testament is found in Matthew chapter 16. And uh, it was um, Jesus taught about the church upon the confession of Peter, who said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that great confession, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church. And so he was announcing here something new, something that was, would separate this congregation that Jesus Christ started with his disciples from all other assembly, all other congregations. And so that's Matthew chapter 16. Now, we know quite a bit about the, 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 the local church and the book of Acts and what's taught about it in the New Testament epistles, but in Matthew 16, it's the, the first time that Jesus Christ expresses the idea of a church, right? He came as a Jew. He went to the synagogues and he went to the observation surrounding the temple. But now he is announcing something to his disciples that is completely different than they've heard before. Now, keeping that in mind, we come to two chapters later. So this is right following his announcement of I will build my church, disting distinguishing this group from all other groups and all other assemblies. And subsequent to that, what is the first teaching that Jesus Christ is going to bring his disciples to? It's concerning the church, and that is Matthew 18, after the first announcements of Matthew 16. So notice Matthew 18 and um, verse 15. So here's what Jesus is teaching his disciples. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother." But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, now again, this is, that word is the only way, the only understanding we have is based on what Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church. What church is he, what assembly is he talking about? Well, his church that he announced, this entity. And so he says, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and as a publican. And so here there's this idea, uh, if you would, uh, three aspects of as far as the method. There is, uh, you could say, the personal attempt, which is, if thy brother trespass against thee, go tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And so that's the personal interaction. But then if uh, he is not able to gain his brother, then you, there is a plurality that steps in. Uh, and that is, uh, if he does not hear thee, take, uh, take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And so then there's plurality, but uh, evidently the last step, is publicly. So you have personally, plurality, and then publicly, and that is the step that follows. There is a trespass or a fault. Take it to him. If he doesn't hear, hear you, one or two witnesses. If he doesn't hear you in the presence of witnesses, then you take it to a public, something that is public. And here, that public entity is not just, right, public in front of everyone, but specifically the church. In the context of Matthew, two chapters before Matthew 16, he's, he's talking about his church, the Lord's church, the church of Jesus Christ. And so with those things in mind, we talked about, uh, turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. This is where we began last week in Galatians chapter 6. Um, through the New Testament epistles, really the, the whole idea of the New Testament, the epistles, even Revelation chapter 2 and 3, is that the church has a, an accountability directly to Jesus Christ, and there's a way that the church is to preserve uh, the aspect of discipline. And we spent some time in our last study talking about the necessity of self-discipline. If we never want to get to the place where we are under the discipline of the church, the congregation, then we have to constantly exercise self-discipline, self-examination, and those are necessary things. Uh, and so in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, he says, notice, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Uh, and we have 
in the subsequent verses, the biblical attitude that should be prevalent in the church. And here we kind of sense the spirit in the next verses. Verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate with him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to, to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And so the spirit of here, this passage, is that there should be uh, no attitude in the church. By the way, the context of verse 1 is, if a, 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 um, um, a man, brethren, be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness concerning thyself. And so there should be no attitude of superiority or anger when a brethren is overtaken in a fall, um, but rather an attitude of care, kindness, forgiveness, and humility. And so we find this here, that's the, the spirit. Again, when we think about church discipline, people tend to see that in a negative light, but we noted that the goal of church discipline is always twofold. Restoration and preservation. Restoring someone who uh, falls in sin and preserving the purity of the church and preserving also uh, the saint. And we think about, we may think about, remember, we are all members of one of another. And so we may think about someone who's overtaken in a fault as a dislocated member. And he need, that bone needs to be relocated. Right, And so the idea is we, we are restoring the body, preserving the body of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. And by the way, the emphasis of that word restore, it's an interesting word. Um, again, as I mentioned, the, the, the same Greek word is used when speaking of resetting a bone which has been dislocated. That's restoring. Uh, the, the word, if you do a word study, the word means to mend, to furnish completely, to restore. And so the idea is in the uh, metaphorical way uh, of restoration by those who are spiritual uh, of one who is overtaken in a trespass, such as one being as a dislocated member of the spiritual body of Christ. And so we see here the importance um, withdrawing someone from the fellowship of the church is always the last resort. Okay, let me say that again. Withdrawing someone from the fellowship of the church is always the last resort. And so New Testament church discipline is about protection and restoration or preservation and restoration. And let me say this here before we, we move on, that we, we have to be discerning because when, when someone is forgiven and when someone is restored, we have to recognize that forgiveness does not mean trust. Now, it's important here. Uh, let me give you, if somebody, let's say, uh, let's go to the church at Corinth where uh, there was uh, immorality going on in the church. Well, you, if someone comes before the church, seeks for forgiveness, then you forgive that person. But then you don't all of a sudden put that person in a place of leadership. You forgive, but that doesn't mean you trust them and put them in a position of authority. So, by the way, we can forgive without giving trust to someone in the area of leadership. Uh, trust always takes time, consistency, and accountability. And so, uh, because I don't want us, because there's a, the potential of us uh, falling in a ditch on both sides, of not having a forgiving spirit, right? And we ought to, but on the other hand, uh, giving complete trust to someone that's forgiven, and, and we ought not to do that. And so, um, and so we have to be uh, conscious of this. Now, let me establish here some things about uh, the idea of the principles of church discipline. Uh, you see, the Word of God, I believe, sets for us uh, principles or laws that are to be followed in the practice of proper church discipline. Uh, 
And, and so here, let me put it this way. The first admonition is this, is this is something for every church member. When we think about the area of church discipline, what is it that we all need to live by? Here it is. Number one is the law of love. The law of love. Um, let's look at a few scriptures. I'm going to have uh, folks turn. Who'd like to turn to John 13, verse 34 and 35? All right. Uh, Ray, uh, John 15, 12. James, and let's do one more. First John 3, 14. First John 3, 14. All right, Bill. And so let's look at those verses. And here we're talking about the law, and this is for every member of the church. That means this, that you are not excluded. All right? This is for you, and specifically in the context of church discipline and how we act towards one another, what is our disposition towards one another. And so let's begin. James, uh, if you want to turn to John 13, uh, you got it? Or who? who? Okay, right, sorry. Uh, John 13, 34, 35. All uh, right, go ahead. New commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you Okay, now that is a very strong statement, is it not? By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one for another. And so every member, the mentality, the mindset, the heart of the church member towards the other church members, because here the context is Jesus says not, well, have love. He says have love towards one another. And that's how all men will know that you're my disciples, if there is that love for one another. So the specific is love is always demonstrated, okay? It's not theoretical, right? In other words, you can say, I love my brother, but how is that manifested, okay? Love is never theoretical. It is always practical. And so here he says there has to be a demonstration of love towards one another. Uh, so it goes beyond a feeling, right? Uh, let's go, who uh, James, I think you had John 15, 12. Go ahead. This is my that you love one another as I love you. Okay, and so here in this aspect, he says um, uh, that the that love is to be demonstrated as I have demonstrated towards you. And uh, here's the summary of the love of Jesus Christ. Um, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, Jesus loved us and demonstrated his love for us, not when qualities were present, but when qualities were absent. So the greatest way that the church can demonstrate love towards one another is when somebody fails or somebody offends you. Correct? It's, it's, it's a small thing to love someone that acts already, always kind towards you. But when somebody violates your trust, when somebody says something to you or does something to offend you, that is when true love steps in. And that's the love of, of Jesus, as I have loved you. So the demonstration of love is chiefly manifested when somebody has been offended, and you have to respond to that. That's where that is manifested. Let's look at another one in 1 John 3, 14. Uh, yes, Bill. Uh, we know that we have passed death into life because we love one another. He that loveth us has life. Okay, now here he, he plainly says, here's one of the evidence that you're saved. Here's how we know that we've passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. And so here he declares that one of those evidences of salvation. And so we could refer to this as, uh, and, and people, when they refer to this as the royal law, they, they refer to it in terms of their salvation. That, well, I, I try to live by the royal, uh, we know that's not how you're saved. But the point is, it is a royal law for those who would be the people of God within the context of the local church. Uh, and so, by the way, it is love that pushes us to restore somebody, right? Um, the lack of action or discipline. By the way, we understand that in the book of Proverbs with the regards of, uh, of parents towards their children. If the parent does not take upon themselves to discipline their children, God says they don't love their children. That's pretty categoric. And so the same idea is within the context of the church. If the church does not act, let's say somebody is overtaken in a fault. If the church does not act as the church at Corinth, they ignored it. That is not a sign of love. That is not, it's the opposite. It communicates that there is no care for the body. And so that is, again, the prevalent attitude and spirit for every church member, the law of love. Now, 
when we get into what about for the offender, what is the law that the offender is to abide by? It is this, the law of confession. The law of confession. So for every member, the law of law. For the offender, the law of confession. Uh, uh, turn with me. Who'd like to read? Let's all turn, but uh, who'd like to read James 5, 1? James chapter 5 and verse 1. All right, Ray, and then a little later we'll go to, who'd like to read 1 John 1, 9? All right, uh, Frank. So uh, what is the law for the offender? So James 5, actually, uh, did I say 1? 5.16, let's go to 5.16. <clears throat> Okay, now do you notice what is connected to confessing? Confess your faults once to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. So in other words, confession brings healing or we could say restoration. And so where a member has wronged another, his duty is to set things right between the two parties. Uh, and so we think about... Um, the personal sins, I think, that we could go down the line. First of all, our personal sins have to be confessed to God. All right, 1 John 1, 9. Um, Frank, do you want to read that verse now? 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so personal sins should be confessed to God personally. Private offenses between two parties should be confessed privately to the other person that you've offended. And public sins should be confessed publicly. Okay, and that's before the church, in the context of the church. And so for the offender, the one who has offended, there's one law that he ought to live by, whereby comes healing, and that is confession, the law of confession. So for every member, the law of love. For the offender, the law of confession. And I've said this before, but to confess means to say the same thing. So, um, um, I gave an example, but in our church in France, a young man had uh, committed fornication to a woman that he was, uh, a young lady who he was engaged with. And so they were intimate before marriage. And it became public, and people in the church knew it. And so when he came before the church, he said, here's what I've done. I have committed fornication. And he came before the church. By the way, he was forgiven and restored. And that's a wonderful thing. But the point is, confession means to say the same thing. Not, well, I, I made a mistake. Right? Or, well, I, I made a boo-boo. That's not confessing. Confessing is to say the same thing that God says about it. And, and by the way, that makes it real. And it's, by the way, it's hard to forgive and restore un unless you know what that person has done. And by the way, when somebody... Let me put it, when it's public, people know what it is, so you don't need to hide it and say it's a mistake. Everybody knows what it is, so you don't need to lessen the sin. You just need to say what it is. And so we see here that the, the law for the offender is the law of confession. But let's go into, what about for the accused? So for the accused is the law of initiative. Uh, turn. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, and uh, who'd like to read verse 23 and 24? Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. James, go ahead. <clears throat> yes. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave, thy, uh, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Okay, so here, you've done something. Right, you're the accused. And so here he says, now before you come, and this is in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching his disciples some principles about life, and he says, look, if you bring your gift to the altar, which is right, seeking uh, communion, fellowship with God, reconciliation with God, uh, first go and be reconciled with your brother. If you know that you've done something to offend him, and so for the accused, what is the law that he is to live by? By the law of initiative. He is to initiate. This law ought to be exercised even when no offense has actually occurred. 
Now, that, that seems be, may seem to be strange, but, but the truth is and uh, we there ought to be an a, initiation on the part of the person that has been accused. You know, a lot of times people get offended over misunderstandings. It, it happens a lot in church over something that is misunderstood. And so if there's something that misunderstood, by the way, the thing is to try to initiate a reconciliation and, and not to say, well, there was, it was just a misunderstanding, so let's just move on with our life. The animosity is still there. And so for the accused, the law of initiation. So for all members, the law of love. For the offender, the law of confession. For the accused, the law of initiative. But let's look at one more for the offended. Well, what if it, you are, you've done nothing wrong, but you have been offended? Well, let's look at a few passages here. Who'd like to uh, read Luke 17, three, verse 3 and 4? Luke 17, verse 3 and 4. All right, Ray, and then uh, Matthew 18, verse 21 and 22. All right, uh, Frank. So Luke 17, 3 and 4. Go ahead, Ray. Do you notice here the, the, the strength of the command, thou shalt forgive him? <laughs> it's like the thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill. I mean, that, that's the strength of that. Thou shalt forgive him. Uh, in other words, that's the law of forgiveness that the one who is offended, and remember Peter asked the question. Of course it was Peter. Well, how oft shall I, brother, trespass against thee and you're going to forgive him? Seven? And Jesus says 70 times seven. And uh, it doesn't mean you have to count 70 times seven. It simply means stop counting. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's more than you think. Um, God doesn't keep track of how many times we've offended him. He's, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. There is no count. And because we enjoy that type of forgiveness from God, then those who offend us should enjoy also the same type of forgiveness from us if we know something about it. See, here I think the greatest way, uh, the greatest way to put our heart in the right disposition to forgive somebody else is if we consistently come to God and ask for his forgiveness every time we offend him. I'll tell you, those who are not willing to forgive are those most likely who are not consistently coming to God and asking for his forgiveness. Because if you enjoy that type of forgiveness, it's hard to say, well, I'm forgiven all the time, but I'm not going to forgive this one offense. Uh, you, you see, uh, so for the offended, the law of forgiveness is what uh, he is to live by. Let's look at the other one, Matthew 18, verse 21 and 22. Uh, go ahead, Frank. Then came Peter to him. Okay, so here, here is the laws or the principles that we are to follow in the practice of proper church discipline. So for every member, the law of love. For the offender, the law of confession. For the accused, the law of initiative. And for the offended, the law of forgiveness. Now, uh, that is the, the, some of the principles or laws of church discipline. But let's go into now the purpose of church discipline. We, we touched on this briefly last week, but uh, let me give you some points here so to, we can keep it concise. But what is the purpose of church discipline? There's a number of things. First of all, we exercise church discipline, first of all, to preserve the truth. To preserve the truth. See, every New Testament Baptist church is the... The Bible says the pillar and ground of the truth. The, right, that's what the church is to be. The pillar and ground of the truth. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.15. And therefore has a God-given duty to uphold and to maintain the truth of God's word. 
Uh, Paul, when he wrote to Timothy and Titus, as the pastors of those local churches, he encouraged them to do exactly that. Let's look at them. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, 3, and 4. Who'd like to read those verses? 1 Timothy 1, 3, and 4, right? And then James, Titus 1, 10. And then I'll ask you, James, to do Titus 3, 10. So 1, 10, and 3, 10. Um, again, Paul is writing, and Timothy, and uh, so Timothy was left, uh, uh, Titus, in the same way to, to uh, give guidance uh, in church matters. And uh, so here, here's what he says to, to these men. So 1 Timothy 1, 3, and 4, right? Okay, so Timothy was to, to, to stop false doctrine. That's what he was supposed to do. Uh, church discipline here, uh, you can't teach this anymore. Okay, look, it was already going on. So Paul says, Timothy, you have to, to respond to that. Uh, you have to exercise here discipline. By the way, if he's teaching, then it's a public thing. Everybody knows this teaching is going on in the church, and Timothy has to stop that. What does he say to Titus? Uh, another pastor, T uh, Titus 1.10, James Okay, so Jews, um, and then uh, 310. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition rejects. Okay, so now notice he says after the first and second admonition, <laughs> right? So you give the warning, he doesn't stop, he continues to give a second warning, and so uh, the third, the third is you strike out. Okay, third strike, you're out, you reject. And so that's an area of discipline, right? You come the first time, give a warning. That's not respond. You give a second. And you, you, see, you see the grace of spirit, right? The intent is not just to cut everybody off every time something does something wrong, but to come in the spirit of humility to restore someone with the intent of preserving the truth. But if that is not heeded, then that person is rejected, and there is rejected from the fellowship of the church. Um, by the way, that's Titus. That's what he is to do. As, as the pastor of the church. Uh, another area is to preserve church order, to preserve church order. Um, uh, by the way, remember the church of Corinth was divisions and contentions, and it was prevalent in the church at Corinth. Uh, let's go to, who'd like to read 2 Thessalonians 3.6? 2 Thessalonians 3.6, uh, Wayne. And then who'd like to read 1 Corinthians 14.33? 1 Corinthians 13.33. 14.33. All right, right. So uh, let's look at those two. Uh, now, so the Bible instructs here a church to do what? In 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Okay, so evidently, right, Paul in Thessalonica had ordered certain things. Later, Timothy and Silas had gone back to Thessalonica to check it on him and to confirm their faith. That We see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, here's the reason why I sent Timothy to you to instruct you specifically in those areas. And so he says, you're supposed to withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly according to the tradition you have received of us. And here he's not necessarily talking about uh, right, the, 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 the command says the tradition. That means that Paul had set certain things in order. And he had told Timothy and Silas to set certain things in order, and some were walking disorderly. And so that's the general idea of disorderly conduct in the church, that you're not supposed to let somebody, uh, let me just give you an example, in a church meeting, and somebody always gets up, and whatever the church wants to do, they always stand up, and they're always angry, and they're, they're causing a, a uh, they're hindering the spirit of the church. And so he is to be thinking about that, of those who walk disorderly. Uh, let's look at the other one, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. Ray. Okay, and then uh, read, go down to verse 40 as well. Okay, so a church is organized, and there must be good order for it to function as God intends. 
God is not the author of confusion. Here he confronts the church of Corinth. Evidently, there was confusion. There was disorder. And Paul says, no, God's not the author of confusion. Let all things be done decently and in order, because people like to come in and, and sow disorderliness, not do things uh, within order. And so to preserve, to preserve the truth, to preserve church order, but there's another purpose to church discipline, and that is to preserve church purity. You see, um, if you put, if you have a barrel of apples, one rotten apple eventually corrupts the whole barrel of good ones. Uh, this process is, by the way, can never be reversed. So, first, let's look at a few ones here when we think about church purity. Uh, who'd like to read 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7? 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7. Uh, Bill, and then Revelation 2, verse 14 through 16. All right, James. <clears throat> so, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7. We'll start there. And then read the next verse. Okay, so here he says, uh, and again, he had mentioned uh, immorality in the church at the beginning of that chapter, and now he says you have to purge out the old leaven. And that's a reference back to the Passover, to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where all the leaven was to be removed from outside their houses. And so take out all the leaven out of the houses. And so in the same way, the picture there is remove the leaven from the church. Okay, that has to be done. Um, let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Again, uh, why? Because here the, the idea of leaven is impurity, corruption, sin. Right? Sin unrepented of needs to be purged out. Uh, Revelation 2, 14 and through 16, James. Now, uh, which church is, is he writing to here? Yeah, the, ch the church of Sardis. Okay, so here's, what was that? Uh, Pergamos, okay. Uh, and so he, he says here that uh, there is this doctrine, those who hold this doctrine. Uh, and so what do he say next? What do, we, what do we do with those? Which thing I hate, and then, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so there is always a downward progression with sin in the church. Um, what was compromise in Pergamos became corruption in Thyatira. And so you find that there's always a downward progression. And so some, here is why is, you know, people say, well, let's not deal with it, let's not confront it, let's be compassionate. Well, you're promoting the corruption and the destruction of the church. So that's not a healthy thing. That's not compassion. It's not the right thing to do. And so those things have to be addressed to preserve church purity. Let's keep going here. Uh, we also see that it's necessary to preserve church unity. Um, let's look at a few here. Who'd like to read Romans 16, 17? Romans 16, 17. All right, Ray. And then 1 Corinthians 1. 10, 1 Corinthians 1, 10, Frank, and then 1 Corinthians 12, 25. All right, James. And so we're going to see here that the Lord wants his churches to be, uh, we saw that in the doctrine early on, to be perfectly joined together. Uh, there must be, uh, as he said, no schisms in the body. No schisms in the body. And so divisions are always detrimental to the church. Uh, 
And so the church unity has to be preserved. So Romans 16, 17, go ahead, right? Okay, mark them and avoid them. They're, they're causing division. They're causing something, teaching something that is contrary to what we have received. 1 Corinthians 1.10, Frank. Okay, so again, there are some who are causing division, but we have to be joined together of the same mind. Uh, chapter 12, verse 25. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care of one another. Okay. So again, we want to, the purpose of church discipline is not only to preserve the truth, to preserve church order, to preserve church purity, to preserve church unity, and I'll give you a few more now, just mention verses, but also to preserve church holiness. Um, I've taught through this, but what is the chief attribute of God? His holiness. The reason why I call it the chief attribute is that it's the only attribute that's mentioned three times in succession, and it crowns all other attributes. For example, God's love is a holy love. God's righteousness is holy righteousness. And so holiness of God is what crowns all. And remember, God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. There are two um, uh, attributes that God directly calls on his people to liken according to himself, and that is his holiness and his mercy. Okay? Be ye merciful, for I am merciful. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And so if we are, if the church is going to allow sin undealt with, it's not going to preserve church holiness and reflect well on the Lord. And so the proper exercise of discipline has a restraining effect upon the others, and it is a positive means of promoting holy living. And by the way, that has to go down to the core. I'm just thinking of the example in Acts of Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira deceived uh, Peter. They, they, they lied to the Holy Ghost. They lied to God. Um, and uh, the church, certainly the members of the church, didn't know that was going on. But And by the way, God doesn't always deal with us in that way. But he gives us one example so that He we might know what he feels about it. And so he says, if you're going to be a deceiver, here's what I think about it. Now, God is a merciful God, and he doesn't. He is long-suffering, um, and so he doesn't always deal with his people in that way, as he did with Ananias and Sapphira, but he just lets us in on what his interest in, in preserving holiness. In that case, just think about it, Ananias and Sapphira brought money to the church. That's a good thing. They just deceived, pretending that they brought all, and they didn't. It's not like they didn't bring money to the church and God killed them. They brought money and God killed them. Why? Because they lied about it. And so God just lets us in, in uh, you think about it, uh, if you remove the deception. They brought money to the church and God killed them. Sounds strange, doesn't it? No, they brought money and they deceived the church about it. And God killed them. And so that's how, what God thinks and how he wants to preserve the holiness of the church. Those who are, act this way, God says, should not be part of the church. Now, what does that take is, obviously, we're, every time, that's a hard issue. And so we have to be exercise constant self-discipline in our own lives. right? If we judge ourselves, we will not be condemned with the world. And so there has to be that constant self-discipline so that we never get to the point where we have to exercise public discipline in the life of the church. It also to pres it's also uh, the purpose of uh, discipline is to preserve the sinning church member. Remember Galatians chapter 6, the purpose, we talked about this last week, that the purpose of, of church discipline, public church discipline, is always, always to restore the offending, uh, the, the, the member who's, who has offended. Always restoration. Uh, I mentioned last week, every time that I've seen that exercised, it has never been a bad thing. It's always been a good thing for both the church and for the offending member. And the church has always been quick to forgive. 
And I don't know if you've had the opportunity to see that in a church that you've been. I've had the opportunity to see that on a number of occasions. And it's always something that's good, healthy, strengthening for the church. And the sinner has always been restored. But he has to come and confess. He has to abide by the law of confession. And so I've never seen the scenario where someone has, has committed a sin. And he's come before the church and says, I've sinned. And it's terrible. I've asked God to forgive me, and I'm coming before the church, and I want you to forgive me. And I've never seen anybody in the church saying, ah, no, we're not willing to forgive you. I, I haven't seen that happen. Right, because why? Because I, the, 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 the members is, they abide by the law of love, by the law of forgiveness. And so uh, may the Lord help us to see that church discipline, which is seen in a neg- as a negative thing, is actually a positive thing. Right, the, the, Those are positive purposes. To preserve the truth, that's a good thing. To preserve church order, that's a good thing. To preserve church purity, that's a good thing. Unity, that's a good thing. Holiness, that's a good thing. Uh, uh, to preserve the, the, the sinning member, that's all good stuff. And so uh, church discipline has to be seen as something that's good, productive, and healthy in the life of the church. And that if the church doesn't exercise uh, discipline, then it's corrupting itself. It's hurting itself. 